But I'm going to show you a little clip here. Um, when they told me the title of the talk, I was like super stoked. At first, the title was Jesus in Nature, and I said, hmm, I can do that, but if you give me God in Nature, I can do a lot more. Later, maybe if we can talk about Jesus in People, I would love to do that talk with you all. But God in Nature is what the talk's on today, which goes along with our theme about God and all, and all in God. And I hope you enjoy this. I guarantee you will not look at creation the same after you leave the class today. So. Individuality, the trademark of any artist, designer, or architect. Each desires a uniqueness to their creation, a quality that separates it from any other. Man naturally has this individuality, his fingerprint. There are 6.5 billion people on the face of the earth, and no two fingerprints are the same. Everything we touch or make contact with is branded with a small expressed image revealing to all who see it who was there. Around 1200 AD, a man named Leonard Pisano, better known as Fibonacci, discovered a sequence of numbers that created a very interesting pattern. The sequence begins with the numbers 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and continues indefinitely. Each number is obtained by adding the last two digits together. A rectangle with a length and width of any two of the numbers of this sequence forms what is known as the golden rectangle, a perfect rectangle. A golden rectangle can be broken down into squares the size of the next Fibonacci numbers down and below. If we were to take a perfect or golden rectangle, break it down into smaller squares based on Fibonacci sequence, and divide each with an arc, the patterns begin to take shape. We begin to see Fibonacci's spiral. The spiral in and of itself is insignificant. Its importance is revealed in where we find it. Take, for example, the sunflower. The display of its florets are in perfect spirals of 55, 34, and 21. The sequence of Fibonacci. The fruitlets of the pineapple create the same spiral based on the sequence. The pine cone does the same. As currents move through the ocean, and the tide rolls onto the shore, the waves that bring in the tide curve into a spiral that can be mathematically diagrammed onto a plot at the points 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and 55. Buds on trees, sand dollars, starfish, petals on flowers, and especially the nautilus shell are formed with this exact same blueprint. With each segment of growth, the Nautilus adds to itself one more value on Fibonacci's scale. This blueprint can be seen around us on a small scale every day, but the greatest example of all is directly above our heads. At an average of 100,000 light years across, even the spiral of the galaxies above us are formed with the exact design that the tiny shell is formed. This sequence, or blueprint, appears to be the trademark of a designer, a proof of a creator, something left behind indicating the one who was there, a fingerprint. As we scan our universe from the tiny flower to the awe-inspiring galaxy, we see the fingerprint of God. You know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical language. Ooh, it's <laughs> I'm a visual learner, so I hope this is helpful to you. I'm going to start with some philosophy and theology for you, and then we're going to transition into what I like to call nature meditations. And I found an old journal of mine as I was preparing for this, and 
the stuff I wrote, it's older than I think anyone in this room. Even you, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of, kind of Oh, I see Katina joined us, so. But uh, how old I am I? Okay, so maybe they were written before Katina. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I forgot what I was thinking. For <laughs> this circle represents the totality of reality. In other words, there's nothing outside of this circle. Okay, so it, it's just a metaphor, a symbol, to help you try to get into the thoughts we're trying to accomplish here. And what I've included over here are three graphs that kind of explain major world views on how people see God's relationship to nature or creation. On the far left, we have classic theism. And in classic theism, there is a really strong emphasis on the distinction between God, who is separate from the creation. So you'll often see it portrayed like this, like God's out there, or if you grew up in fundamental circles like I did, we used to sing this song, um, Somewhere in Outer Space, God Has Prepared a Place. <laughs> you know, this idea that God is other, outworldly, beyond space and time. And it really focuses on kind of like the holiness aspect of God, um, God's complete control of all things. And the technical term for this, we'll get to in a minute, has to do with substance. Switch back to my black marker. But that's a really loaded, loaded term. Let me get out of this. <laughs> we'll come back to these. <laughs> we'll look at a slow vision. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to those. <laughs> So in classic theism, we have this strong distinction. And a theist is someone who believes in God, but a God who's both transcendent and imminent. And today, what I'm going to focus on is the imminence of God. What does it mean that God is imminent? Imminence is also a tricky word. Because <laughs> we have the word emanate, emanations, eminence, imminent. So, what does eminence mean? It has to do with God's quality and characteristic of his omnipresence. Mm -hmm. What does omnipresence mean? He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He is everywhere. everywhere all the time. Everywhere all the time. And when I first learned about this concept, um, I was so excited because it changed everything immediately. God was no longer somewhere in outer space or out there or other. God was as near to me as my next breath. God was as close to me as my coffee mug. Okay. So when we start talking about the eminence of God, it means there is no place where God is not present. My dad's a fundamentalist Baptist preacher. I remember coming home for Thanksgiving. Why there was a ketchup bottle on the table, I don't know. So sad. <laughs> but I remember asking my dad very clearly. I said, Dad... Is God in that ketchup bottle? And he said, don't you blaspheme in this house. <laughs> and I said, just answer the question, Dad. And he said, of course not. God is not in that ketchup bottle. And I said, so you're telling me there's a ketchup bottle-shaped vacuum in the universe where God does not exist. <laughs> and he said, wait a second. <laughs> because the implications, if you start denying God's presence in certain places, what you're doing is you begin to shrink God. And I guess what I would say is, my God's way bigger than most people's gods. And it's because I understand this idea that God isn't just out there, but he's also in here. And in this worldview, there is no distinction between God and creation. They are synonyms. Mm. So you can just as easily switch talking about one or the other. A famous philosopher who proposed this was Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza. He took the Shema... Hero Israel, the Lord your God, is one, and he took it literally. But he had precedent for it, even in the Western scholastic tradition. And this is where I want to talk to you about this term, substance. Substance, defined by the medieval scholastics, is that which is self-existing and self-consisting. Let me say that for you one more time. A substance is that which is self-existing and self-consisting. Well, based on that definition... There's only one substance in the universe mm. because God is the only being that fulfills that definition. 
fascinating. And so that gives kind of some philosophic credence to this sort of thinking or understanding. This idea that God is the only self-existing, self-consistent. In other words, God didn't need anyone else to create him because God always was. And God doesn't need anything else to sustain him because he's self-sustaining. All other creatures are contingent and dependent. We rely on something else outside of ourselves for our existence and for our continuance. And so God is in a category on his own in this sort of thing. Another aspect, and this is the philosophical weight to this sort of thinking, if you believe God is the totality of the reality, but then I go around this room and I ask, say, randomly someone like Christine, are you God? No. Oh, Christine. <laughs> so now we have God <laughs> plus Christine. And if I say to you, to that beautiful oak tree by the fountain, is that oak tree God? So now we got God and an oak tree. And what about my lovely coffee mug? Etc. <laughs> so says, well, you can see if we took the time and we started listing all the things that are not God, all of a sudden I've had the whole rest of the board populated, and the circle would continue to shrink smaller and smaller and smaller until God suddenly goes out of existence. Because God is not a physical material being. God is spirit. And we can list and name all these physical manifestations, but the reality is these are modes or expressions of the very person of God. No raised eyebrows yet? Amazing. <laughs> the, the middle one is how you can deal with this from a Christian perspective. See, if you start saying Christine isn't God or fill in your own name, the tree, the coffee mug, you start to make minus from God's reality whatever degree of reality or being these individual items have. And God ends up looking like Swiss cheese, or worse. We reason him right out of existence altogether. The solution is, in panentheism, where these things exist inside of God. And so that's the key here, this word. Oh, I'm sorry, I switched these. Sorry about that. <laughs> I meant to put it in the middle, but I, I wrote before I did that. So panentheism is this middle position between this detachedness of theism, which can lead to deism, which you believe there's a God, but he's removed from the creation, and panentheism, where there is no separation whatsoever. It, it's synonymous. And so panentheism is... Acknowledging there's a God and acknowledging there's a creation, but this creation is nested in or has its reality in the very substance or person of God. So, in that sense, we are all in God right now at this moment. Fascinating. And I'm not talking in a saving way or anything like that. I'm talking about in your very being or substance. We are in God. Ooh, are we warming it up in here or what? <laughs> Where's the... Can, can you give us some chill? <laughs> chill. I'm sweating. Chill pills. And it's not even because of heresy or anything. <laughs> okay. Another guy I want to talk to you about is, his name is John Scotus <coughs> Ariogena. And John Scotus Ariogena, he lived in the ninth century. Um, his name actually means John the Scotsman, Scotsman. And he was from Ireland, but at that time Ireland was Scotia, the land of the Scots. And he was the premier Greek scholar of his day in the West, and he went and translated a work um, called Dionysius the Areopagite that was gifted from the Byzantine emperor to the king of France. And when he translated this, it revolutionized his way of thinking. And part of it was because it was heavily influenced by this way of thinking, by this sort of philosophy of life. That this idea that God is the source of all things, and all things will eventually return to God like a big cosmic loop that God 
empties himself into the creation, manifests himself, and then all things return to him. And we are part of that movement. Well, everything is a part of that movement. So we're caught in this, in this movement of God's expansion and retraction back into himself, if you want to use those words, which are really insufficient. Because it's not like God grows or shrinks, God simply is. But any movement or thing takes place within the context of God. And one of the little gems, this is a pitch, if you want to join us, we're doing medieval philosophy in the spring, and Scotus will be highlighted heavily, and we'll talk about his views of the divisions of nature. But this one little quote really stuck with me. And Scotus said, all creation is a theophany. What's a theophany? Um, I've heard that term before. A representation or a reflection of Jesus on earth. What is it? Like a picture of God. I don't think it was. No, it's way more than a picture of good. I've heard that term before. I just can't remember the meaning. Would you mind giving me a paper towel? I'm sweating. What was that? A physical manifestation of God. That's what a theophany is. Um, a more refined term would be a Christophany, which would be a physical pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ would be a Christophany. But today I want to talk to you more about theophanies. How can all of creation be a theophany? Is he really implying that every wildflower contains the face of God? Every star contains the light of God? Do they? Or is that paganism? Is that pantheism? Thank you. Does every sweat droplet contain <laughs> God? Does every paper towel with which we wipe our brow, <laughs> is it God receiving God unto himself? <laughs> it's God's masterpiece, I think. I don't know. So are you saying God is separate from his painting? He's saying that the painter puts a piece of himself in every painting. Ooh, a, a piece, piece of himself. Now that's heresy. <laughs> Why is that heresy, Micah? No. He does not take from himself. He cannot. Because it, it flies in the face of the simplicity of God. Wait, are you denying simplicity or are you saying? No, he's saying you're denying simplicity. <laughs> What you just said contradicts this orthodox doctrine of the simplicity of God. I don't understand. Can one of our theologians tell us what the simplicity of God is? Peter can. Peter. Reagan? Well, the simplicity of God was more established, well known by Thomas Aquinas, and it states that God can't be composed of uh, any parts. You can't talk about pieces of God being a piece of God is in the tree, a piece of God is in me, a piece of God is in the rock, because now you are dividing God into pieces. God cannot be divided into pieces, which is quite curious since Christians hold strongly to the Trinity. But the Trinity are not three pieces of God. It is one. God is one in essence with three persons. But it's not three parts of God. There is one God, one part, three persons. Okay. So if you were following this all the way, like straight to the T, this logic T, you take it like as far as Genesis one six six goes, God made little gods. Well, of course. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Little little G gods. Yes. <laughs> but that's another talk. That's the theosis <laughs> talk. If you want to have that sometime. Now I want to focus primarily on what does this look like to be in God and to have God in all things? And how would that change our relationship to the world, to the creation, and to each other? So, Samson, if you want to just scroll through that. I'm sorry I didn't have time to make a slideshow, but I uploaded a ton onto my Facebook page if you want to look at them later or whatever. I'll just let Samson go through those. 
And I, I wrote these while I've spent a lot of time in the wilderness. And maybe it's because I'm not so spiritually adept. I think a truly accomplished person could find God just as much in a tire repair shop. That's one of Steve Witten's stories. I love it. How him and God fix in and plug in tires together. I mean, that's some deep spirituality there. I would be thinking like, oh, it stinks in here and it's hot and I can't believe I'm doing this. And I, let me get out into the creation. It's so easy for me in the creation to see God once I get away from the noise and confusion of man. But to be able to see that in your day-to-day -day life, that's transformative. Mm. You know, not just when you have your escapes or your retreats or whatever, but to see God throughout the day. And I just want to share a few of these meditations. I notice my eyes have changed since I wrote this. <laughs> Hopefully it won't make me look too intellectual. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this first one is called the wind. And you can just sit and, and meditate on these. And it will kind of give you some insight in how I relate to nature, God and nature. The wind goeth towards the south and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continuously. The wind returneth again according to its circuits. Ecclesiastes 1.6 The only song of the trees in the forest comes from the wind blowing through their boughs. So too our only true song comes when God's spirit moves through us. The wind provides a good example for the spirit, for neither can be seen or grasped, yet both can be felt and their effect on other things can be readily seen. As Christ told Nicodemus, wait for it. <laughs> uh, this is one of my all-time passages in the Bible. I can hardly stand it. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and you hear the sound thereof, but you can't tell where it's coming from and where it's going. And so is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. Just love it. Are you like the wind? Do you come and go with the Spirit's pleasure? Are you set in your routine, your program, your habits? that you can't move or get out of. Be like the wind. <laughs> the wind in all its various forms should quickly leave us, um, bring us to remembrance, the Spirit of God moving across the face of the earth. Now, let me be very clear. I am not saying the wind, the physical wind, which we can talk about changes in temperature, creates different movements across the globe. I'm not suggesting that that is the Holy Spirit. What I'm suggesting is it can be like a re remembrance for us to think about the Spirit of God. <laughs> and this Spirit permeates all things. There's no place where it does not reach. And so that's what I'm talking about here. I'm not trying to personify the word or anthropomorphize it. I, what I'm simply saying is God has chosen that word. In fact, the very word breath, Baruch, is the same word used for spirit. And God breathed the breath of life into man, and he became a living soul, that animating principle of human beings. <laughs> it was getting a little preachy. <laughs> <laughs> Whether the wind be a driving gale that none can stand before, or a soft, soothing breeze, it reflects God's spirit and gives an intimation of the various ways he relates to man. And I love that. You can feel the strength and power of a hurricane force wind or a cooling, gentle breeze, and God has that full spectrum. He rages against the wicked and unrighteous, and he's comforting and gentle to those who seek mercy. And so those, all those aspects we can feel and comprehend in the wind. May our, may our lives be as hollow reeds before our God, so that his spirit moving through us will be our only song. His song moving through us, may every thought or deed come from his spirit, so that everything that is done will glorify his name. All right. This next meditation is on water. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is never full. Unto the place from whence the rivers come, there they return again. And that's Ecclesiastes 1.7. Water is a good picture of our spiritual lives and teaches the importance as giving as well as receiving. And 
I've come across a lot of water in my days, <laughs> and I've learned a valuable lesson. And I'll take a body of water you probably all know, the Dead Sea. <laughs> the Dead Sea is filled by the sweet water of the Jordan River. It's fresh, it's drinkable, <laughs> etc. But because the Dead Sea has no outlet, that water just builds up and it salinates and it becomes a sterile, literally a sterile dead environment. And so too, the same thing happens in our life. You guys are so blessed to be at this place. Some of you may not think so, but there's so much great teaching, great doctrine, great instruction, great examples here. And it's like that sweet, precious water flowing into your lives. But if you don't have an outlet for that, if you're not pouring that into the lives of others, it's going to become bitter, brackish, and dead to you and to others, where it's not life-giving. So you need to be like tilted cups before God. And as God pours into you his love and goodness and grace and mercy, our cups need to be tilted to others so it flows into the world around us. John 7, 37 says, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly, and that word there is his innermost being, out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And that's a great question to ask yourself. Are you still thirsty? Are you still seeking? Are you still striving? Or have you received that overflowing gift of the Spirit of God that literally replenishes and refreshes you and brings life to you, but it wants to flow out into others. It's not something just meant to be hoarded for yourself. <laughs> okay. He's just pulling up pictures. That's fine. <laughs> they are kind of cool, though. This is called Wisdom from the Woods. Better keep a track or we could be in here a while. <laughs> Okay. Life is like a great forest, and that is because people are so much like trees. In fact, if you didn't know this, that's exactly how I see all of you. Uh, I'm a mountain gardening gnome, and you are the trees that God has brought into my garden for the season. And so, if you think I'm being mean when I'm pruning off your branches and, you know, picking off disease parts of it. It's not. It's because I love you and I care about you and I want you to grow strong and bear much fruit. I love to water you, but I mostly love to fertilize you. That's my great joy in life, is spreading fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> like trees um, of every shape and size can be found in all their appointed places and each with their specific natures. Some are tall and straight, living in pure stands among other trees, just like themselves. They see little hardship, for they grow in fertile, well-watered valleys that are protected from droughts of summer and the stormy, strong winds of winter. Among these trees, it is the short, among these trees, it is the short, um, withered or bent that is the oddity, for they have been sheltered from the harsh side of life. And maybe that's where a lot of you are right now. You've lived a relatively sheltered upbringing. Um, you grew up with people that looked like you, believed like you, acted like you. And now as you enter into the more wild world, you're going to realize that not all trees are like you. And some have had a much harder go at it. And it's not that I begrudge your sheltered valley. I'm good for you. I'm happy for you. But there's other types of trees. The forest, however, isn't only made up of the straight and strong, but it also contains the weather-worn who live in the exposed crags of the mountains and the delicate and frail that live along the banks of deep, slow-moving rivers. Yet the great forest, like life, is not complete with only one type of tree or one type of person. For each one is important, not only for what they have to give independently, but also how through their diversity they help make complete the whole. As in life, so in the forest, the greatest beauty and versatility comes when a multitude of diverse parts come together, each contributing their own specific gifts to make complete the unity of the whole. And, you know, Paul talked about the analogy of us being the body of Christ, different members. I just simply have a forest analogy in my head. 
Some of you are willows, some of you are oaks, some of you are mighty sequoias, some of you are little scrubs. But it doesn't matter. You're all precious in God's sight, and God has made you for a specific purpose and task, and you need to embrace that. Don't compare yourself to other trees or other people. You're not them. You weren't meant to be them. Be who God meant you to be. I'd read the next one, but it's too convicting. <laughs> it's about leaning trees. There was this one time I was in the forest, and this like hurricane force wind had come through, and about every third tree had been um, destabilized, but because the forest was so thick, very few trees actually hit the ground. They had fallen, and the other trees were holding them up. And I immediately thought of your dad and church and why we need fellowship and why we need to be with other people. Because if any of those trees had been standing alone, they would have been on the ground, rotting, decomposing, going back into the soil. But because these trees growing in community had each other, they were able to survive and continue even at that. And so that's what that one was about. Okay. I hope it made your dad happy. Okay, this is called Nature, God's Wordless Book. <laughs> You're right. right. Thanks. <laughs> These are not helping me. Some mornings when I awake in the wilderness, it is as if I find myself in the midst of a great and unfathomable book. Yet this book has no written words, for it is a picture book, a song book, a spoken book. It is the oldest book known to man, and although it has many parts, pages, and chapters, it has one continuous theme that binds it all together and runs from beginning to end. This theme and purpose of this book are to proclaim, show forth, and bring glory to God, who is the author, upholder, permeator, and finisher of this book. This is the same book spoken of by the Apostle Paul in Romans 1. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Also, David in the Psalms often refers to this book. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the world, and their words to the end of the earth. Psalms 19. God reveals himself in many ways to man. His greatest revelation of himself came in the person of Jesus Christ, where God actually took on human form and lived among us. It is through this revelation that we have life and reconciliation with God. God also left us with a written revelation found in the Holy Scriptures. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God also reveals himself through the Holy Spirit, and without his work, none can be drawn to God. Without the Holy Spirit's prompting, no man seeks God. Without his leading, no man can come to Christ and the belief that he is God. Without the Holy Spirit's enlightenment and illumination of the written word, it remains but foolishness to the mind of man. And without his indwelling and the understanding of God's wordless book, it is never grasped. For without the teaching of the Holy Spirit, the wordless book is misinterpreted and its message confused, if not denied altogether. The new, two most common misinterpretations of God's wordless book is pantheism, where you confuse the creation with the creator, and you actually become a worshiper of the creation instead of the one who made it. And then the other error is to deny the creator altogether and to just say, all we see is the, is the world, where's the creator of this world? And so you have materialism, denying the supernatural, only seeing the creation, and then on the other ditch you have people who have exalted creation to the place of the creator. And so you need to avoid these two ditches to realize there is a God, he is unique and separate from the creation, but the creation is not separate from him. It does not exist independently or autonomously from the creator. Is that a clear distinction for you guys? Okay.
it's really important. I know it seems petty, but it's really important a difference. That, that little in in pantheism makes a world of theological difference. So it's now on the creation <laughs> or God's wordless book that I would like to focus my attention. Sorry, you just showed a funny list. Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's a few in there. Okay, where am I? What I want to share with you is how well creation does this if we but take time, open our eyes, listen with our ears, taste with our mouth, breathe deep through our nostrils, touch and feel, and let God's indwelling spirit open the book that is all around us. Um, the reason I like to call creation God's wordless book is, does anyone remember how creation was made? Seven days and God actually spoke the physical world into existence. And the more we learn about physics, especially quantum mechanics and quantum physics, we realize this physical material world is not as solid as it appears but that everything is vibrating. Everything is moving. Fascinating. So, if you take a literal reading of Genesis, which I do, and God is literally speaking the world into existence, what you are seeing when you look out these windows, you're seeing the residual vibrational frequencies of the voice of God made manifest. When God said, let there be light, God created a vibrational frequency that we interpret as light. When God created plants, trees, um, seed-bearing herbs, that's literally the voice of God being made manifest in physical form. You yourself have an extra step. God made the earth from which you were formed, but God then molded you and breathed into you. So you not only have a container, which is the vibrational frequency of God's own voice, but you have the very breath of God inside of you. That's incredible to think about in those sorts of terms. That should change the way you walk on the face of this earth. When you think about Christ being incarnate, it would be like, how many of you are artists in this room? You, you paint or things like that. It would be like if you painted a picture and then you were able to step into your painting and interact with what you had created. Can you imagine the sor sorrow and heartbreak when your very creation mocks you and rejects you and wants nothing to do with you? It's like the tragedy just increases exponentially when you think of it in that sort of context. The reason I showed you that Fibonacci video is because they, some people have liked to call the Fibonacci sequence um, the thumbprint of God. That the spiral that's created. And we see that throughout creation, from the palm fronds behind you, to nautilus shells, to your thumbprints. We see it everywhere, the spiraling of galaxies to you know, the wildflowers you find, or sunflowers. You see the Fibonacci spiral. And to me, it's like trademarked by God, or copyright by God. This is part of God's collection. This is part of God's design. And all of it tells you something about the one that made it. And once you begin to see creation in that way, I think your relationship with it would change. At least I hope it would. I try to give people that disrespect God's creation this sort of analogy. I said, to me, when I see you walking around campus and you're just pulling leaves off trees or, or pulling up a chunk of sod or something like that, and, and you don't think anything more of it than some inanimate object, what I would say to you, it would be like if you came to my house and you looked at some of my paintings on the wall and you just went up and like tore off a corner of it or, or spat on it or something like that. And I'd be like, hey, what are you doing? And they'd be like, I'm not doing anything to you. I was like, yeah, I get it. That's not affecting me directly, but that is the work of my hands. That is something I cared about. That is something I created. That is something I invested in. And you are showing a complete disregard and disrespect. And I would take that as a disregard, disrespect of me. And that's how I, I see the creation. Not that I'm worshiping it, but this is the work of my Father's hands. This is the very work of Christ. 
He was there creating the world in the beginning. And I want to honor that creation, not worship it, not make it my God, but it's the work of my God, and I want to honor it in that sort of way. Does anyone? Yes. I have a question. You got it. Um, so, if that, so living out of that, how can we justify eating animals or eating plants? <laughs> That's a good question. Tastes good. Tastes good. Tastes good. Tastes good. Tastes good. <laughs> In the beginning, it was not so. Um, Adam and Eve were fruitarians, as far as we understand it, where they ate the herbs of the field and the fruits of the trees. And we don't have any account of meat eating until actually after the flood in the scriptures. <laughs> now, looking at the pre-fall, I mean the pre-flood world, chances are these people were meat eaters. I mean, it said every thought, every imagination of their heart was violence and wickedness. It, it, that's hard to imagine. We have tons of wicked and unwholesome and violent thoughts of, of people in this room, but it's probably not continuous, right, 24-7. We probably have a bit to go to get there. Hopefully we never will. But that's kind of the world they lived in. And we actually don't see meat eating happening until after the flood, which is bizarre, since there's such a few amount of animals, right, for one thing. But that's where we begin to see that take place. How do we navigate that? in our modern era? Well, you could say Christ ate meat. I mean, he was very much a part of his culture, but he only ate specific meats. He was faithful to the Mosaic law, the dietary laws. As far as you living today as a Christian in 21st century America, I mean, that's something you're going to have to navigate yourself. Can you eat meat with respect? Can you eat meat with a love and compassion in your heart? Or is it just fuel for the body? And, and that's how I would put it. I would say whatever we're eating, whether it's plant products, animal, flesh, those sorts of things, it needs to be an act of worship. We're, we're realizing in order for us to live, other things must die, whether that's a plant or an animal. And to go about eating as a sacred sacramental act, where we're not just powering stuff down, we're not thinking about what we're doing. I mean, a lot of us will give a token blessing before our meals, like, thank you, Jesus, for this food. Amen, right? But think about what it took to bring that food, food, to your plate and where that came from. I mean, from the people that prepared it to the people that shipped it to you to the people that packaged it to the people that picked it to the people that grew it to the people, you know, on and on. Not to mention those individual plants and animals that gave up their very life so that you could live. Now, this isn't a Christian thought, but I find it quite elegant um, from Native American teachings and philosophy. They taught this idea of the giveaway, where in order for us to live, we must take the lives of other things. But one day, we too will give up our life that will feed and nourish those that come after us. And that's why I want to be eaten personally when I die, but we're still working on that with U.S. laws. So. <laughs> You can be planted as a tree now, so we're making, we're making progress, but baby steps. Even though I like the Native American approach, for me it, it all comes down to the very hand of God. And God is providing me my daily bread, my daily meat, whatever that may be. Now, if in your conscience you believe you shouldn't eat the flesh of, of animals and things like that, you know, that's between you and God, and I think that's perfectly fine. I think if you begin to impose and push that on others, it becomes like a type of legalism. Um, so, but I think if you purpose in your heart not to do that, I think that could be a noble or fine thing. And it, it could be good for you both physically and maybe in other ways as well. But for those of you that eat meat, I would say don't be a glutton, eat it respectfully, and eat it with thanksgiving. Yeah. What about when Jesus said to eat my flesh and drink my blood? Yeah, so good. <laughs> There is a, a very metaphysical thing that happens when we consume the flesh of another. It becomes a part of ourself. And I didn't really mean to talk about this today, but there's, there's a concept called, what did I write this? For a minute. Do you remember what you mean? Very much so. I shouldn't say transubstantiation since like that. Hermetic cannibalism. 
And the idea of hermetic cannibalism is, like someone said, you are what you eat. So if you lose a member of your tribe, you don't want to just throw this person away. This is someone you care about. So you want that person back into the group. And so you, yes, <laughs> so you take their body, and sometimes the body is burned, and the ashes are ground up, and then drank by the tribe. Other time, the full flesh is consumed. It just depends on the group. But the idea here, it isn't they're not eating the dead for protein or nutrition or things like that. It's they want that essence of the one they lost to be incorporated into themselves. Fascinating. There's also a, a belief that you take on the, the metaphysical properties of what you ate. So if you're seeking strength, you might want to eat the heart of like a jaguar or a leopard or something like that. If you want sleekness, you might want to eat the flesh of a gazelle or an antelope. If you want beauty, you want that to eat the flesh of that type of animal. If you want to become fat and obese, you want to eat the meat of pigs and, and things of that nature. So, <laughs> yes, please. Thank you. How would they preserve the essence and not have it just eventually go out? Because there's only two ways I know that two can become one. One is through sexual intercourse, which interestingly enough is another analogy the writers of the scriptures use, right? That um, in fact in 1 Corinthians 6, Paul uses the analogy of why we're not to be joined to a prostitute. He says, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when you're joined to a prostitute, the two become one flesh. You become one. And then when offspring are produced, that is the true culmination of two individuals becoming united in one new being, right? So children are, are a union of two becoming one. Fascinating. Further in that passage, Paul goes on to, he switches it and he says, basically, so too, those who are joined to God in spirit become one spirit. So you become knit to God, where his spirit and your spirit are knit together into a unity of one. So that's through sexual reproduction, and the other is through eating. When we eat the flesh of another, our body breaks it down and incorporates it into our own. And so when we talk about, and I don't know how I got on this, but I'll, I'll keep it going for a couple minutes. The Aztecs, part of why they did human sacrifice in their mythology was their people had been destroyed. It's very similar to Ezekiel's account of the Valley of Dry Bones. They were nothing but bones. And their god Quetzalcoatl gave his own blood so that the Aztec people could have life. And so in response to that gift of their god, they wanted to give blood back to Quetzalcoatl. And so they would sacrifice to give blood back to the god. So when the Catholic missionaries came to Mexico with the conquistadors, and they explain Mass to them, and what many of you would call communion or the Eucharist, they're saying, wait a second, you're saying we get to eat the flesh and drink the blood of your God? And the priests were like, yes. And so the Aztec people instinctively already knew what that meant. What they didn't realize was you weren't incorporating the God into you, the God would transform you into him. Really, still no race eyebrows, people? <laughs> oh, let me, in, in the time remaining, let me just comment on a few of these. The one with you, like, in the snow-capped tree is really funny. Oh, yes, that was a good one. Is it okay? Oh, yeah, let's talk about this guy. <laughs> this is a banana slug. <laughs> And, and part of what I love about the creation is the contrast. So in this forest, there are trees over 300 feet tall. But it's not just these grand trees that draw our attention and contemplation and meditation on the wonders of God. It's there's also the microcosm. And once you start to look in the undergrowth, it's just as fascinating as looking in the tree canopy. And these banana slugs, I was looking for like an hour. I couldn't find a one. And then once I saw the first one, it was like the whole forest lit up. It was like banana slug topia. And I was just like trying not to step on it. But it's just our awareness is so interesting that way. We see what we focus on, what our mind is set on. 
And so these banana slugs, I just love them because they're these frail and gentle folk that live in the midst of giants. What else we got? This is the one. Oh. Uh, that's Rockies. No. This is right here. This is the Sierra Nevadas on the east side. I would highly recommend you visiting if you haven't. This is about six hours north from here, 395. And why I love the east side so much is there's no transition. It's This is like 4,000 feet. This is like 14,000 feet. Wow. And there's like no foothills. It just goes boom right up. And so just that contrast and the drama. And once again, maybe if I was more spiritual, I could get the same when I'm looking over San Diego or the LA basin. But when I can see, like as far as you can see, there is no sign of humanity. That's incredible that in California you can drive to places where you can turn 360 and not see any sign of man except maybe the road you came in on. But if you walk there, you won't even see that. And so it's just quite amazing. And I will look unto the hills from whence cometh my strength. Where's our strength come? It doesn't come from the hills. It comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Yes. In case Steve asks. Oh, God's my favorite flower ranger. And look at that. That's a cactus. Speak of more contrast. So you have spikes oh and petals. You know, just right there. And growing out of solid rock. And I just, it's just such a great picture of how our lives can be rooted in the rock of Christ. And out of that, even through the pain and suffering, there's still great beauty. And go ahead, Samson, what else we got? <laughs> I really want to see that one in the... Do you, have a you know which one I'm talking about? The one with him in the snow-capped tree? There it is. <laughs> <laughs> You're just like, hi. Yeah, if you spend enough time in the woods, eventually you'll begin to merge <laughs> into one. I was... When I took that picture, all ghost? I could think of was Jack Nicholson in The Shining, and I was thinking, wow, there's happy ways to be in the snow, and there's not happy ways to be in the snow. I see what else we got. What else we got? Oh, do you see? Does anyone know what color this is? Orange? No. Tangerine? I don't even have a word for this color. It's tangerine and orange. It's for sure orange. <laughs> Samson's um, sister just posted a, a cactus picture and she was talking about how each petal reveals the face of God and I was, I was like, oh yes, that was just this morning. Oh, was that you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> You're beautiful, Samson. I was just thinking, wow, that's exactly what I'm talking about today. It's Go back to that. I like the one that he's standing on the hook. To the back. Back. The one where he's standing on the hook. Look at that. Right there. Look at that. It's like God just took a little paintbrush on the petals and gave it all these different designs. God's paintbrush. And these just grow. So I would really encourage you. Look at the micro. Look at the macro. Oh, this is a high Sierra juniper. So, um, once again on the east side. Did you take this with your like, actual, like a, like a big camera? With an actual iPhone, yes. <laughs> <laughs> These are all iPhone pictures. He was thinking it was like a crazy all right. kid, digital like, like, crazy. Can you do one more? Oh, like, so uh, no. This. I'm always looking for these sorts of things. I call these tree portals. And whenever I see two trees together in the woods, it's like a doorway for me. It's like a, a gateless gate that you can walk into and then everything changes on the other side. And so I'm always looking for these like tree portals. And I was in the woods and I, I looked up the trail and I just saw, it wasn't just like a tree portal, it was like a tree tunnel. And it was just like this beckoning, like, come deeper, <laughs> come deeper into the woods. And I just, I just love this sort of contrast. And 
it gives you time to simply be there and listen to the voice of God and to see the works of his hands. And I know one day, I mean, Isaiah talks about one day the trees will clap their hands, the mountains will sing, the rocks will shout forth. And in the meantime, I try to help them. So when I walk through the woods, I help the trees clap their boughs together when we make praise those songs together. <laughs> and I help skip the rocks across the water and we sing praises to our Creator. And everything should cry out to you that they're here for a reason and a purpose. And I don't care what it is, from a grain of sand to the mightiest galaxy, all of them reveal the simplicity, the power, and glory of God. And that so, dandelion? I hope. Oh, yeah, that's a giant one. <laughs> I'm just Look, it's a symmetry in there. <laughs> in the fractals. I thought you had the little dandelion up. I found a valley that was just pure dandelion. dandelions. So. Did you I've make a wish on that one? <laughs> we probably did. All right. Well, I hope that was a blessing to you. Remember, God is in the rain. Don't be afraid of it. Get out there and, and dance in it.